Kazam, a Nassau County legislator for the 18th district, who was elected in November running on the Democratic and Conservative Party line. Josh is now running um, in the Democratic primary for New York's third congressional district and is joining Blank Slate Media as part of its series of talks with candidates in the race. So, Josh, welcome. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Uh, definitely not my first forum uh, with Blank Slate, so I appreciate all the work you guys do uh, to empower our local voices here, and uh, really great to have this conversation. Thank you. Um, before we get started, we want to start thank Rob Pelez, our reporter, who is um, doing the behind the scenes uh, for the uh, for this session, and we'll be doing a story on it uh, that'll appear in this week's issue of Blank Slate Media, our six publications, and on our website, theisland360.com. I'd also like to thank Northwell Health for once again sponsoring our town halls. So let me jump in and ask you, why are you running? Sure. So I've served my community for over a decade. Uh, I ran for the Syosset School Board at age 18 as a high school senior to take on an overpaid superintendent uh, and bring more transparency to the school district. And I was reelected to that position uh, with the supermajority. I ran for Nassau County Legislature at age 23 uh, because the county executive and the town supervisor were simultaneously indicted. Uh, and I wanted to clean up local government. I've served at the most local level. I've served at the county level. And I'm ready to serve at the federal level. I'm running because we need to keep this seat in Democratic hands. And I'm the best Democrat to do that, Steve. Uh, my county legislative district, as you know, is it's not bright blue. It's a red district. Trump won my district, but I was reelected twice, including in 2021, where Democrats suffered disastrous losses at the town and at the county level. Uh, quite frankly, I, I win tough races and tough to win years. And there's a lot at stake in this election. And we're seeing firsthand the harm that Washington can do to all of us back home. I'm going to Washington to fight for the issues that Nassau County and Northeast Queens cares about. Uh, and not only do I know how to get elected, I know how to deliver for my constituents. I've passed more bills than anyone in the legislature. I've secured millions of dollars in grants for our schools. I've held public forums that are open in every town I represent. And I'm the only sitting elected official speaking with you uh, and running in this race. Uh, and my campaign's resonating with voters because we've been focused on the issues, focused on keeping abortion legal and safe in New York, taking illegal guns off our streets, making our communities more affordable and getting inflation under control, delivering affordable health care and reducing the cost of prescription drugs. And I have never uh, and will never support defunding the police. And in conclusion, before we get to your questions, uh, I just want to share that I'm so proud to have Congressman Swazi's endorsement uh, in this primary. And Tom knows I'm the candidate to go to Washington. We'll work with anyone who has the same agenda of getting things done for the people of this district. So uh, I look forward to uh, taking your questions. Now, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, are also part of your uh, television campaigns that uh, that I've been noticing um, that you're not defund the police that you're not you would never defund the police. Are there any candidates running in this primary against you who would or who have said they would? We 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 believe the answer is yes. Uh, you know if you know if you if you if you if you look at candidates who've been supported by defund the police advocates, if you look at candidates who are equivocating when asked, would you defund the police? Uh, there, There is not unified oh, can, agreement. Can you, can you name a name? Because I haven't seen, we're, we're following the race and I haven't seen any candidate um, in this race sure, that we has used that term. Sure. Um, now, they may be getting money from people who are progressives, but that doesn't, you know, is that, is that something, is that taboo? Are you, is simply accepting money from somebody who is, um, um, who receives money from somebody who may have given it to a progressive candidate, uh, make them support to fund the police? No, uh, we're, we're talking about folks who've been asked point blank and have equivocated, and we can send you news articles. And quite frankly, uh, we have a public forum tonight, and we have a debate tonight. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share that with the audience, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to provide you, you know, backup. Do you, do you have a name? Has John Kamen or Robert Zimmerman Steve, or, we, we uh, have a, we Melanie have a, Dorigo said at any point that they support yeah. So we we have a forum with 500 plus folks tonight in Syosset. Um, I'm, I'm, prepared, I'm prepared to answer that question when we have our forum. Why wouldn't you answer it now? Quite frankly, in terms of debate prep, I'd like to keep some of my some of my 
some of the, uh, <laughs> you know, the arrows in the quiver here, Steve, but I'm happy to provide you some of our materials that we have. Okay, well, let me ask you, um, so um, you're not for defunding the police. Um, we haven't seen anybody um, who has said that. Um, what are you, in, in, in terms of um, um, police, uh, in terms of police and police reform, um, what should be done with police? I know that you, authored legislation uh, in 2021 um, that would uh, allow first responders to sue any person who harasses or attacks or injures them while they're in uniform. Um, I think the reason you gave is that you felt that they were under criticism following the, uh, uh, the George Floyd shooting. Um, so. Let me ask you about that legislation um, that was um, supported by Republicans. Arnold Drucker, one of your co-sponsors, voted against it, um, and uh, Laura Kern vetoed it. Um, is that what you think, do, do you count that? Um, do you count people criticizing police um, nationally for how they're policing as yeah. part of that to fund the police. Yeah, Steve, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked the question. And, and I just want to correct the record here. Uh, first responders were already a protected class in Nassau County, and they already had the right to sue for damages like every civil servant in the state. My bill simply empowered the county attorney to offer additional assistance to first responders. But I will say, I should have communicated to community activists and leaders who would have been affected by the legislation before I filed. Uh, it was a mistake on my part. It's why I didn't vote against the county executive's veto. And as a county legislator, I've passed numerous bills since going to the community and bringing in community stakeholders. And I've gotten bills passed. It's well, how I'm going to function in Congress. But fundamentally, I believe well, that- Let me ask you this, Josh. I mean, Kathleen Rice, who was the Nassau County DA, mm -hmm. now a Congresswoman, not running for re-election, um, said she supports police officers and first responders but it did apply to them. And she said it was wrong to codify in law a chosen profession. And critics said it would intimidate people from exercising their free speech rights uh, when, confronted, when confronted by that. Yes, yeah, Steve. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, I understand you were looking to support police. Um, what should be done? Is there a need for police reform? Of course. Um, I, of course. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in how police are, 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 are doing their jobs. Of course there is. Of course there is. And, and just, just, just to push back, to correct the record with due respect, police were made, like for all first responders and veterans, they were made protected classes in 2019. 2019, not last year, 2019. That's law, that's public record. But of course we need police reform. Of course okay, we do. Okay, so you wanted to add the county attorney to go and assist a policeman, sue somebody who was protesting at a rally. Not about protesting. Steve, this mischaracterization is actually outrageous. All it said, the, the intent of the bill was to protect first responders who were assaulted on the job. But of course we need police reform. The answer is yes. And quite frankly, we've passed police reforms in the county that I would support nationwide. Officers in the county wear body cameras. That protects not only our first responders, but it protects the citizens they serve. And we need body cameras nationwide. Mental health response. My bill with legislator Bino evaluated how we do police response here in Nassau when it comes to mental health aided incidents. And we know there's a potential chance of injury or death at a greater level when there's mental health aided responses. And so we need to reevaluate mental health response across the country. We need larger and more diverse recruiting classes of police. And so we are not doing a good enough job here in Nassau we're not doing a good enough job in this country of making sure that our police departments and the recruiting classes reflect the communities they serve. So of course we need reforms. Of course we do. We need more training and we need it today. And it's my job as a member of Congress to go to Washington and deliver funding here. Um, okay, so, and, and you have said that you're in favor of banning assault weapons? Absolutely. It's, and, it's that's, not and that's in all cases. We're talking about uh, weapons like the AR-15, 
you would be in favor of a national ban. Of course I would. It worked in the 90s and it can work again. The idea that somebody needs a weapon of war is outrageous. The, the idea that somebody can walk into a school building in Uvalde or a supermarket in Buffalo and take human life is, is outrageous. It makes us all less safe. And so absolutely, I'd be in favor of an assault on, on, uh, on a ban on assault weapons. Okay. Um, let me go to um, abortion. Uh, you mentioned making um, uh, access to abortion um, being a one of your one of the one of the things that you've been highlighting yep. um, in your campaign. So my my question I, I my question goes to you've also run as a on as a conservative, and the conservative party is one of their primary tenants is opposition to abortion, um, both locally and on the um, state level. Um, the right to, and I'll, I'll, the conservative party is actually the right to life state conservative party. And it's an organization that opposes abortions by offering counseling, prayer, and other assistance to expectant mothers once pro-life justices. So how is, um, how can people be comfortable with you being the person protecting abortion rights if in fact you've accepted the endorsement and run on the line of a group that is opposed to abortion rights? Yeah, Steve, you know the answer to this question as well as anyone. Many Democrats in Nassau and Suffolk are endorsed by many different groups running for local office. And quite frankly, my work here on substance abuse brought together coalitions from different parties and different groups across the ideological spectrum. Right, Nassau County recorded the highest level of heroin deaths, one of the highest levels in the nation. And no, I, we're talking, we're talking law, about abortion here. I understand and, that, Steve. And, you, the, and the primary Steve, if you, if you let me answer your question, I'd love to be on your show okay, and answer your question. You know, I, I don't know where drug use um, is if, having if you, to do with abortion. Because if you'd permit me to answer your questions, I can get to my point with due respect. So substance abuse was an area of prime concern for many different groups the Conservative Party included. But this idea and this attack from my opponents that I'm somehow a conservative is outrageous. I've been unequivocally pro-choice for my entire life. I'm leading the fight to protect a woman's right to choose here in Nassau. I've worked with the police commissioner and first responders to add an increased security presence to our reproductive clinics and to our abortion clinics to make sure that any woman seeking reproductive services is free from harassment and abuse. And when I get to Congress, I'll codify Roe into law. I'll work to secure the data privacy of women who purchase abortion pills online. I'll protect out-of-state doctors and providers who provide abortion services. I'll fight any effort by the federal government to permit red states from pursuing charges against women seeking out-of-state abortions. I'll protect contraception. I'll increase funding for Planned Parenthood. I've been unequivocally pro-choice my entire life. But and I, there I, are staunch, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna... And I'm gonna answer your question if you'd let me wrap. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, we'll and, get to it no, and, 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 and an answer. We have other here. questions we want to get to you. That's right. Well, and, and, and to wrap and to summarize, there are major intractable differences at the national level in which the Conservative Party would not endorse me, nor would I ever accept their endorsement because I'm staunchly pro-choice and I'm staunchly in support of same-sex marriage. Okay. But again, why would you accept? We understand that there is the support for drug treatment goes crosses all economic groups, all ethnic groups, that everyone wants to do it. But the primary focus, conservative party merged with the right to life party. It is 100% opposed to it. It supported Supreme Court justices who have overturned Roe. Why would you then, why would you then seek their endorsement and run on their line? Steve, once again, you know the answer to this question is that many Democrats. I, I, not, I, honestly, I don't know the answer. I don't well, know why. Okay, so I don't know why somebody so, who's so pro, me, pro abortion, so let me give somebody you a, who was who was pro choice okay. would run on a line of a group that is its main its main focus is opposition to yeah. abortion. So 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 I'll take you at your word and I'll give you a very simple overview. 
that many Democrats on Long Island, many of our foremost Democrats, from Errol Toulon, the Suffolk County Sheriff, to Madeline Singers, the DA, to my colleague and friend Delia Dirigi Witten, many Democrats are cross endorsed by many minor parties. And at the local level, the local level, minor parties like the Conservative Party believed in substance abuse and lower taxes as their two number one issues at the local level. I've never raised a dime in property taxes, and I cut taxes by $70 million in 2021. And I passed Timothy's law to make sure we get a 24 hour hotline for substance abuse. So I checked the boxes on those local issues. Running for federal office, there are intractable differences. I would not accept their endorsement, nor would they offer it to me because I am staunchly pro choice and I'm staunchly behind same sex marriage. And I carry those democratic values with me to Washington. Okay. Um, all right. Let me, let me ask you an, an, another question on this, and that's kind of related to it. Um, you were quoted back in 2016 as saying um, that, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but you're quoted um, on Facebook, on a Facebook post, as that I have not war, nor will I endorse a presidential candidate. I want young people all over to come to that conclusion after research and consideration of your own. Is that, is that accurate? So, yeah, so first, first and foremost, I'd love to talk about the issues that I'm working on in this election. And, you know, this well, is another. No, well, we'll, it, it, we'll, right, well that, you know, I, I think the fact I'm going to answer, you, I'm going to answer. But with due respect, did you, endorse, love, did you endorse Hillary Clinton? Of, over, course I, of course, I voted for did Hillary. Did you endorse her? Of course, I voted for Hillary Clinton. Steve, I was a local school board member and I believed, like I do today, that local government should be nonpartisan and that the politicization of local governments had a deleterious effect on our politics and on local governance. And we've seen it rear its ugly head as the politicization of school boards across this country has not served students. And that was the point I was making, is that local government should be focused on local issues, that there was no partisan way to take out the trash. There's no partisan way to clean a park. There's no partisan way to pave a road. Of course, I voted for Hillary. Of course, my family voted for why, Hillary. Why, what, now, you're saying that you said this because you were specifically talking about endorsing a presidential campaign and you wanted young people to reach their own conclusion. Precisely, because young people who are involved, I was a school board member at 18. I had young people involved in local politics for the first time in the district's history. And I wanted local government to be nonpartisan, focused on the issues on the school board. But you were, advise, you were advising them on a presidential election. Not, in my not, school board not, capacity. Not, not, Steve, That's fine, but you were still advising them on a presidential election. Wouldn't it be better to advise um, young people of the potential, what, the, of what can happen? This is know, what happens if there's a presidential election. Sure. Well, it's, it's I, and I'm, I I'm mean, sorry. I mean, you got three Supreme Court justices that yeah. overturned Roe v. Wade. I think that's a lesson for people in terms of the importance of casting your vote in a presidential sure. election. And I'm sorry to be to you know to to scoff at at, at the, the idea, but the premise behind the question is whether I supported Hillary. Of course I did. And in my private capacity as a citizen, you're damn right that I counseled my friends who reached out to me to vote for Hillary. You're damn right that my friends and my uncles at the dinner table who I had to convert, because I knew the dangers of Donald Trump back in 2016. We all knew and we saw the the, the, the ramifications of his presidency on this country. But quite frankly, what I see here is I see a forum in which I'd love to talk about the issues. And it seems that you're airing the opposition that my opponents are trying to paint me as some sort of conservative or some sort of Republican. It's outrageous. So I came on your show. You run, as, you run as a conservative Let's and you advise about... people not to. I think those are legitimate questions for a Democrat running. Yes, so Steve, let, me, let me ask let's you this. Let's talk you about the issues, please. Let's, okay. Let's know why um, you're saying you're in the best position to win uh, in this district, um, which is now Eastern Queens and yeah. good hunk of Nassau County. Of course. Um, what happened now, uh, what happened in the past election? In Nassau County, Democrats were swept. Why is that? What is, what, in your opinion, yeah. what is it that, you know, what was the reason for them being doing so badly. All four Nassau County seats went to Republicans. What was the reason for that? 
Yeah. So, and, and just to, first in, in answering your question, you know, I'm a Democrat who represents a Trump district. I won it three times. And in 2021, in the year you're referencing, 27% of voters, 27% were Democrats. We should have gotten demolished in this district, but we won. And I think it's because of three main things that we're doing, which I think Democrats need to do a better job. Uh, one is we out-organized our opponent. Democrats need to be organized. We need to be knocking doors. We need to be making calls. We need to be turning out the vote because turnout is lower for Democrats in off-year elections than in midterm and presidential elections. Number two is, is ra raising money. We raised more money than every legislator and their opponent combined in Nassau County. We worked hard to raise the resources to compete. We have a very well-funded Republican opponent who's got nearly a million dollars in the bank and has no primary. And we're going to need a Democrat in this district who can raise money to get the resources out and combat misinformation. I've raised more money than any candidate in this race, quarter after quarter after quarter. Uh, and lastly, it's an appeal to voters across the aisle. This is not a safe blue district. This, according to Cook and 538, is a toss-up district. So having a Democrat who can win over independent votes and to win over moderate Republican votes is going to matter in November. I'm a Democrat who's done it, and so I can do it. I rep a Trump district. I've proven that I can win in tough-to-win places and tough-to-win years. And so I'm the Democrat to keep this seat in Democratic hands. Absolutely. Um, well, actually, you know, the question was, why did the Democrats do so poorly countywide? What was well, the reason? I, 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 well, yeah, I, th um, I, well, I think it was those, those three reasons I articulated. One is I think that we need to organize better. And again, I cannot denigrate any individual candidate or any individual committee. I'll never do that because we had amazing candidates running. And oftentimes with a wave of one party or another, when the pendulum swings, sometimes people get swept under. But the three things we need to do a better job at, one was organizing, two was raising the money, and three was working across the aisle to get our message to every single voter. I think I've, I've been a, a case study in proving that it works here in District 18. We're gonna use that case study in November. And I think Democrats across the island uh, can take a page out of our playbook. Now, you, you had a close race for somebody who was Paolo Peroni, who was a newcomer and took a very, uh, he was a, I guess, say a ultra MAGA candidate. Yeah. Um, maybe not that different from George Santos, who's been a very uh, strong proponent of that. Um, what role did bail reform play? In that, do you think it, do you do you think that the Democrats um, were hurt by um, the issue of bail reform, and could they have done a better job in responding to that, or was that something that was out of their hands um, and something that the state legislature had done, and they were bearing the consequences? No, I think Democrats absolutely need to message better on the need to fix bail reform. Absolutely. Just just to touch lightly, uh, you know, but before I move into the, the reasoning. Um, so in my district, we had a candidate who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? An individual who was immensely wealthy. You did not have that in other legislative districts. So there was more spending in my legislative district than all of the other 18 districts combined with outside money and with all the candidates. And that's why this was this election was close. And quite frankly, Again, 27% of voters in my district were Democrats, and my district went for Trump. This is a Biden plus eight district. So how, many, how many were Republican? I can, I can pull the numbers, Republican, conservative, independent. I can, I can pull the numbers and get that for you after. I know the number of 27% Democrats stands out because we had to work so hard to turn the vote out from people across the ideological spectrum. But I share that because the district went for Trump. The congressional district is a Biden plus eight. Uh, and so I know that as a common sense Democrat, I can win it. But in answering your question, do I think Democrats messaged poorly on bail reform? Absolutely. I think we need to be firmer that judges need discretion. I think we needed to be firmer uh, speaking about crime. Uh, and, and, and I think it, it, it absolutely played an effect in, in some Democrats losing. The, the, on, on bail reform, and um, do you think that there were two sets of reforms after the original after yep. it went into effect in January 2020 and met in April of that year, there were changes made that give that gave judges more discretion. And then this past legislative session, um, it was also expanded that. I think Eric Adams, the one thing that he said that he wanted was including dangerousness yes. as a standard for doing that. Um, is there anything else in terms of judges' discretion? Because twice they've increased that. So my question is, 
are we at the right point now? Or are we just short of that now? What do you feel should be done? Um, because I think the Republicans are saying, forget about bail reform. We should go back to what it was in 2000 seems to be now the answer. Right. And, and there, there needs to be nuance to this conversation. But, but, but to answer, quite frankly, bail reform needs to be fixed. The fixes have not gone far enough. We need to give judicial discretion back to judges to hold people in place who are most dangerous to the public, right? Dangerous statutes are used in 49 other states. Uh, there's no reason we took away our trust from judges. And the Sixth Amendment guarantees Americans the right to a speedy trial. And a person who can't afford a lawyer shouldn't stay in jail any longer than a person who can. But the reform taking away judicial discretion, it makes our state less safe. And 3,700 people were rearrested after being released without bail. We need to reduce instances of repeat offenders, especially those who pose a public threat to make our community safe. So Albany needs to go back and fix it. Okay, is there any particular? The dangerousness is what's been it, but discussed by Eric Adams. Are there other areas, specific things that would make significant changes? Sure, so I think more specific crimes ha ha have to have to be added, right? So if you listen to first responders, uh, and if you listen to detectives here, and we're, we're happy to pull a list because uh, you, you know we, we, we listen to first responders, we listen to detectives, we listen to crime victim advocates uh, when, when talking about the need for change here. But at the very crux of this issue is trusting judges to have discretion over holding people who pose a public danger. And I trust our judges to do that. Okay, but you don't think that those changes work Changes were made in that area, giving judges more discretion. Not enough. Are you saying it was not enough? Not enough. Okay. Are there any particular areas other than dangerousness where you think that should be added, or is it the dangerousness? I, well, it's 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 the crux of the conver it's the crux of the conversation here, right? Is 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 that judges who believe that somebody poses a public danger uh, or have their discretion taken away from them, uh, and and so that is something we can achieve and something we can move across the finish line in Albany. Uh, obviously, I'm not running for office in Albany, but I'll work to advocate for my state legislators to, to, to make that happen. Um, okay, things that were mentioned in the city in particular um, were firearms, the availability from coming in from out of state. Uh, again, Eric Adams has mm -hmm. been saying, you know, you've got to stop the influx. And there are a number of states, Illinois is another one where um, they have very tough gun laws, but other states don't have it. Um, what would you do on the federal level to stop the flow of guns into places like New York and Illinois? Sure. So the Iron Pipeline poses a major danger here, right? We, we know, you know, if you look at the, the gun epidemic, you know, gun violence is, is it's a uniquely American epidemic. And, and just to contextualize the data for your audience, you know, a million Americans have been shot in the past decade. And 45,000 people lost their lives to gun violence. Uh, and, and so quite frankly, we need to get illegal guns off our streets and we need, we desperately, desperately need universal background checks at the federal level. We desperately need a ban on assault weapons. We absolutely need to have the courage to pass a national red flag law to make sure we have stronger gun controls in place. And we need to make sure our first responders have the tools necessary to get illegal guns off our streets, to stop the flow uh, into the city, you know, into Long Island uh, that, that, that make us all less safe. Uh, you know, gun control is, is, is and, and sensible gun reform. It's not only a, a public safety issue, it's a public health issue, uh, and it's an epidemic, and it needs to be addressed with the urgency that it merits. Um, there is now a, we know inflation is a major issue. You mentioned it as one of the things that you want to focus on. Yep. Uh, the Democrats have come up with a, what is now termed a inflation reduction plan yep. um, that was negotiated by um, Chuck Schumer and uh, Joe Manchin. Um, we'll see if Christian Cinema goes along with it and it passes. Um, do you support that, the uh, legislation that they've come up with? I do. I do. Right. The Inflation Reduction Act, it does a number of things, but, but in terms of importance to Long Island families and, and, and families in Queens, right, it extends those Affordable Care Act subsidies to keep premiums low. It raises the corporate tax on our largest corporations to make sure the wealthiest companies are paying their fair share. It's going to bring down the cost of Medicare prescription drugs by allowing the federal government to negotiate. It's going to deliver federal dollars from that infrastructure bill that we passed here on Long Island. And we know $1 invested in infrastructure is $5 in the local economy. It's going to bring key components of the supply chain home. Uh, and, and quite frankly, we, we need to do more, right? We need to raise the minimum wage to take pressure off the labor, labor market. 
We need to restore the salt tax deduction. We need to end corporate price gouging. So there's so much more that needs to be done because everything's too expensive from gas prices to groceries to prescription drugs and healthcare. Uh, so action needs to be taken, but this is absolutely a bill that I would support in Congress. Um, what was not included in this um, that was in Build Back Better yeah. uh, was universal pre-K child care credit, uh, four weeks of paid leave, um, and the um, uh, tax breaks for working uh, people. Um, should that now, that was termed as something that would feed inflation. Um, do you think that would feed inflation or, and would you be in support of it? Were the Democrats to uh, win uh, a majority in November? So, right, so, so my, my, my goal is to, is to get a package passed, right? My goal is to pass a package that's gonna bring down costs for the people I represent. And so absolutely universal pre-K not only will it make a difference in terms of an ROI uh, on our kids for, for decades in terms of getting a head start in education, but it's going to help parents afford education. And you mentioned paid leave and allowing people to raise families. You mentioned the, the child tax credit, which, as we know, cut pop child poverty in half in 2021. So all those measures make a difference. And I absolutely would be supportive of all those measures, but I'm supportive of getting something done. And so if the Inflation Reduction Act is a compromise that we can get done today, then I'm going to vote for it today. And I'm going to go back and fight for more. Um, what would you or and how would you respond to the issue? What do you what do you think is the cause of inflation? What are you? This is this is a debate. Republicans are obviously blaming it on the Biden administration. Um, what do you think when we talk about uh, the the components that go into it, and then what else you might do to respond? Sure. So, you know, it's it's the the irony of, of, you know, economists, the most brilliant economists in this country can point to all different metrics for why inflation. This this, this is not a 30 second soundbite answer. Right. Inflation is occurring for a number. We, of we, we have time. This isn't this isn't yeah. a commercial. This no. Is well, well, I this share that because it's frustrating where I feel that politicians often misled people to believe that somebody or something is the cause of inflation. It's a million things. Right. The covid-19 epi- you know, pandemic. Right. One, one of one of you know, the greatest pandemics that, that, that we've had in the last hundred years, you know, was a driver of inflation. All the government spending that we, that we needed to make sure we kept people in their homes, kept people who couldn't work from working PPP and, and, and all of all of this federal aid. But it's, it's not just COVID. It's the war in Ukraine. It's, it's, it's supply chain issues across the country. Uh, it's the it's the breakdown of, of, of global commerce. There's there's so many issues to point to. Uh, and there's so much we can do. Uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act will, in fact, reduce inflation. Uh, it will. It, it, it absolutely will. Right? And, and there, there are things that we can do now to reduce inflation. Um, you know, quite frankly, raising the minimum wage and taking pressure off the labor market will reduce inflation because we have such a labor shortage in this country that it's driving up labor costs and it's driving up the cost of goods passing on to the consumers. Uh, investing in infrastructure will reduce inflation. One dollar invested in infrastructure has a multiplier in economics of five bucks in the local economy. It's not only going to create jobs, but it's going to help deliver money here. Bringing the key components of the supply chain home is going to reduce inflation. It's going to isn't make sure. Gonna, isn't that going to feed inflation? If I'm, if you're doing things like um, infrastructure and you're having that multiplier, um, you're doing that at a time that the Fed is trying to cool the economy by raising interest rates. Um, and the same thing with and, and the same thing with salary. They don't want salaries to go up because that increases uh, the cost um, in creating a fl- inflation. How do you how do you balance that? There there is a del- there's there's a delicate balance here. But I but and this is the perfect example. You know, bringing key components of the supply chain home, right? Investing in our supply chain obviously is an expenditure, but it's going to save consumers money in the long haul. It's it's actually a matter of national security. If you want to talk about semiconductors and America needing to maintain our supremacy on supercomputing, right? Which we have a supremacy and we know AI is gonna be one of the most formidable tactics of war and one of the most formidable tools that countries have in their race for technological advancement. Uh, And so bringing those key components home not only will protect us, but it's also gonna help protect consumers and and, and drive inflation down when there is a lack of a log jam where goods are not stuck in ports, where the global supply chain isn't disrupted, people can get items quicker. 
And we know it's basic supply and demand, right? With the shrinking supply, raises increase in demand, raising prices. That's what we're seeing. So that's just one key component. Uh, and, and, and there's so much we can do, but there has to be a, a delicate balance here. So what, what would you recommend to address inflation that is already not being done? Because the Fed has now raised the uh, interest rate twice by 75 basis points. Yep. Um, in, and that's in recent months. Um, we do have the Inflation Reduction Act. Are there other things that ought to be done in your view? Yeah, well, so, so I, I mentioned it, right? Raising the minimum wage is not part of the Inflation Reduction Act. It should be. It's going to take pressure off the labor, mar labor market. Investing and bringing key components of the supply chain home is not part of the, in the Inflation Reduction Act. It's important. It should be. Um, you know, quite frankly, restoring the SALT tax deduction, while not directly attributable to inflation, is going to provide immediate relief to people in this district. And it's going to allow them to weather some of this difficult time. Just like extending extending those those ACA you know premium subsidies, which is part of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's going to help keep premiums lower. Uh, raising the corporate tax on our, on our wealthiest corporations is in there. Uh, we need to do more to make sure that the wealthiest in this company are, are paying their fair share. Uh, we do not go far enough in the Inflation Reduction Act to allow Medicare to negotiate with prescription drug companies. We should have not just a narrow list of ten drugs; it should be a much larger list to bring down costs for people. So there's so much more we can do. But I am a common sense Democrat. I'm going to Washington to get things done. If we can get this done today, we should get it done today and go back and fight for more. But people need immediate relief, and they're tired of waiting. So let me ask you this, because you mentioned you're a common sense Democrat, mm -hmm. um, and and that was the and and that was something that I think that Tom Swasey in endorsing you, the the, the uh, current congressman for CD3, um, has said. What constitutes a common sense Democrat? What is yeah. what is you know, what is that? I, are are these other guys? Is you know, is John Kamen and uh, Robert Zimmerman? Um, do they lack common sense? Or is their approach? You know, are they out there radical um, Steve, figures? I, 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 you know, so so Tom Swazi and I have you know have have similar taglines, common sense Democrat, because we take a similar approach to public service. That we're people who pull together coalitions to get things done, and we're people who go to serve and will work with anybody to move things across the aisle and deliver for our constituents. I I, I will not be baited into denigrating any one of my elected officials or anybody who's running against me. I'm running to tell people who I am. I'm not running to tell people what someone else is doing. But I'll tell you, I am a common sense Democrat. I'm focused on kitchen table issues. I'm focused on the economy and prices. I'm focused on reducing the cost of health care. I'm focused on helping people afford prescription drugs. I'm focused on delivering for the people in this district. It's what I've done and it's what I'll continue to do. Um, let me ask you, um, you were talking about prices and you're talking about the economy. Mm -hmm. um, immigration. Yep. Um, there are something like 8 million jobs yep. um, that are unfilled in this country. Um, and yet our Im legal immigration, not talking about illegal, and we can also talk to what we should do to the people who are who are there, who are undocumented, um, but wouldn't bringing more people in to this country um, provide labor for jobs that need to be done on Long Island and elsewhere? Um, the growth in population in Nassau County over the last number of years has been based on immigration. Um, it's been an outflux of people who were born here, and that's been compensated by immigrants. Um, what's your view on immigration? Are we, should we increase immigration to help fill jobs? Steve, I, I have a unique family perspective here, so I'm not sure if you knew, but my, my grandma is a Cuban immigrant. Uh, my grandfather was a refugee of the Holocaust. They immigrated to this country, they built a middle-class life and raised a family. And my grandparents always reminded me that uh, our family story was the story of achieving the, Amer the American dream. And millions of other families in this country can trace their lineage back to that dream of coming to this country in search of freedom, an opportunity, and a better life. So the answer is yes, America needs to urgently modernize our immigration system. And we need to make it easier for people to come here legally through the process, right? There's a current backlog of eight and a half million people, and it takes over six years to go through the process. It's far too outdated. And, and Steve, we, we've done it before. 
12 million people passed through Ellis Island in the 20th century. Right? With modern tools like online documenting process and facial recognition, there's no reason we can't recreate this success. And quite frankly, there needs to be a pathway to citizenship for those who are here as undocumented immigrants. There's over 11 million people in the United States who are undocumented. Uh, and there needs to be an outline pathway, uh, whether it's through payment of restitution or some other measure. Uh, keeping workers in the shadows hurts all taxpayers right? through loss of revenue, uh, it hurts workers, as uh, some companies often pay substandard wages, uh, and, and, and it's the right thing to do. Um, what would you, if there are a number, because right now we're the number of legal documented people that are being admitted on a yearly basis is not much better. It was brought down during the Trump administration, um, and it hasn't been increased dramatically by the Biden administration. Um, should that be raised? Yeah, we, we need people to come legally to this country. Of course, we need to increase immigration, right? And, and, and the statistics don't lie, right? The economics speak for themselves. So immigrants wield 1.3 trillion in spending power. Seven in 10 of our essential workers during COVID, seven in 10 were immigrants. They kept this economy moving. They kept food on the shelves. They kept our pharmacies open. They, they you know, there they, are so many essential jobs. They were healthcare workers. And immigrants created one in four businesses in this country including 40% of Fortune 500 companies. So absolutely, the economics speak for themselves, uh, that, that it is an economic imperative and a moral imperative, but uh, there is a clear economic argument uh, that, that increasing legal immigration uh, helps the United States economy uh, and helps this country move forward. Now, we set a limit of 100,000 people from Ukraine to bring them in, and they've been very slow. There's a bureaucracy in getting them yeah. in. Um, is that number too low? Um, considering that Poland, which is a fifth the size of the United States, it's next door, um, but they're, they've taken in two, two and a half million people. Um, and the United States, which is, we, we all like to think of us as welcoming the immigrants out, uh, the Statue of Liberty and Emma Lazarus's, uh, poem. Um, but we're, taking in way less, um, although we are providing the military arms. So our contribution is, is, is certainly there, but should we be taking in more people? I, I, I think the answer is absolutely. I mean, you know, if you, if you look at the Ukrainians, uh, the bravery and the heroism that they've shown to defend their, their home, to, to fight for democracy and, and, and to fight good versus evil has been unbelievable. Uh, and, and so we've been on the forefront of providing military aid and humanitarian aid. And I will tell you, if you speak to people in my district, there are people in this community who are ready to take in uh, and, and, and aid folks you know, from, from Ukraine who, who, who need assistance. So uh, the answer is I would absolutely be open to that. Uh, and, and, and what I'll say here is uh, just to talk about Ukraine, if you'd indulge me, uh, Vladimir Putin is, is the clear, you know, he's the clear aggressor here, right? As, as we as a nation, we're, we're standing with the Ukrainians as, as they're fighting for their own freedoms. Uh, and, and tyrants like Vladimir Putin uh, shouldn't be empowered to just grab land with, with no consequence, right? It it's threatens that post-World War II stable order, and it's a threat to all of our democracies. So, uh, you know, we absolutely need to continue to impose harsh sanctions, uh, reduce the world's reliance on Russian oil, uh, maintain that strong NATO alliance, and work with our European partners to better arm themselves. So uh, the United States has an indispensable role here on the world stage and as a partner with Ukraine. Um, energy, it is being addressed in the Inflation Reduction Plan. Um, is there anything else? I mean, would you be in favor of uh, nuclear power um, as another source of energy that cuts our reliance on uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, uh, and takes the pressure off the European countries? Sure, so I, I, I think a conversation needs to be had uh, you know, if you read The Economist like I do, uh, you'll know that the nuclear power actually is safer uh, than, than most renewables. And it's actually produces less deaths per capita than, than, than offshore wind. Right. And so there needs to be a conversation about about an all the above approach, because we need an all the above approach. We need to invest in geothermal. We need to invest in solar, offshore wind, et cetera. Uh, quite, quite frankly, the energy needs of this country are only going to exponentially increase as population increases and as energy consumption increases. So you know, whether it's expanding electric charging stations, which I've done in this district and we need to do, uh, whether it's 
modernizing our power grid and, and, and getting to a more resilient uh, and, 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 and modernized state of, uh, of, of, of electric, uh, there's work that needs to be done. Uh, and if we're ever going to get to net zero carbon emissions, which we should, we absolutely can do it. Uh, we're going to need to lead the world. We're, we're going to need to lead the world in, in, in clean tech and clean jobs. Um, in the context um, voting rights, yep. um, in the context of the issues, you mentioned you're a common sense Democrat, and you you reference kitchen table issues uh, for people. Um, voting rights is 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 different. Where do you what 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 importance do you place? on what's happening with voting rights in this in this country what's happening with, with voting rights in this country is is a threat to democracy right we've seen a concerted effort to strip away voting rights from people in states across this country uh and absolutely it needs to be taken seriously uh, our right to vote is there's nothing more fundamental to being an american than than, than one person one vote and we're seeing an erosion of protections that people have fought for for decades that they've earned. Uh, and so in Congress, here's what I'll do, right? I'll pass the Electoral Count Act. We need to make clear that a vice president does not have the power to throw out votes. And it's gonna prevent states from changing their method of selecting electors after an election took place. We gotta pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. States are the front lines of voter suppression in this country. And we know the Supreme Court drove a dagger into the heart of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. We need to bring back federal power over election suppression tactics and make it easier for citizens to sue in federal court when voter suppression is alleged and give people more recourse. And we need to pass the Freedom to Vote Act. Right, election day should be a holiday. It absolutely should be a national holiday. We should allow states to have early voting for two weeks prior to election day, nights and weekends, so working people can vote and people working two jobs can vote and parents can vote and students can vote. We need to require that states make more accessible voting for people with disabilities. We need to finally outlaw gerrymandering, which is part of that act. And we need to limit the states that can purge the voter rolls, which is just outrageous. And we need to increase donor disclosure to root out dark money, which is in there as well. So uh, those three bills absolutely are crucial to defending voting rights. I'd be in support of all three. So you may be, and, and this, may, um, this may tie into another issue. Mm -hmm. Right now, things are looking better for the Democrats, particularly if the Inflation Reduction Act passes, but normally in um, non-presidential election years that it favors the out of uh, power party. Mm -hmm. um, the House is a very close margin of five. Um, there's a good chance that Kevin McCarthy will be the Speaker of the House or somebody uh, or another Republican. So how do you then, how do you then represent the district if you're in the minority um, and you don't have the power to pass legislation like that, what is, how do you, how do you then, what, how does your role change if now you're in the opposition rather than the person putting together the legislation? Sure. So I think my role stays the same, right? It, it's, it's my, my role is to go to Washington and, and be unyielding in, in, in those democratic values of fighting for, fighting to protect a woman's right to choose, fighting for common sense gun regulation, fighting to bring down prices. Um, but with the knowledge that in order to get something passed and deliver for my constituents, you're gonna need to build consensus across the aisle. Uh, and, and, and there are issues which I've shown on the local level, I've been able to pass a record number of bills, bringing Republicans and Democrats together to get things done. And I can do it at the federal level, whether it's taking care of our veterans, and I wanna put a roof over the head of every veteran in this country, because we should fight just as hard for our veterans when they come home as they fought for us. And we can get that done, whether it's mental health and making mental health coverage free for students K to 12, because we know suicide's the second leading cause of death among young people and our young people are hurting. Whether it's substance abuse and allowing for treatment on demand and taking decisions out of the hands of insurance companies and putting them into the hands of doctors. Fighting for these issues where we're able to move things across the aisle and get things done uh, is, is, is going to continue to be a hallmark of my service. Uh, but I'll, I'll continue to be unapologetic and unyielding in my belief that democratic values, like protecting a woman's right to choose, like common sense gun regulation, like restoring voting rights, like bringing down prices, will continue to matter. Uh, and, and, and I think that I can represent my district with, again, unyielding persistence on these issues, 
and with the common sense pragmatism that I have to get things done. Um, you mentioned veterans, and this may be kind of the rule that um, kind of undermines the argument of working with people across the aisle because we can't even get right now. We had in the past in the Senate um, money for veterans in the Iraq and Afghanistan war who are suffering yeah. from toxic chemicals. Um, we also, um, there was also difficulty getting approval for the act that was requiring the aid to, um, for the semiconductors. Yeah. So if they won't give money, $400 billion, to the veterans who served this country in Iraq and Afghanistan and are now suffering yep. diseases from them, um, what makes you think that you're going to be able to um, legislate across the aisle when um, the people across the aisle are being very extreme? And if they win, there's a good chance we're going to have more of the Lauren Bobbitts and Marjorie sure. Taylor Greene in the House of Representatives this in, in 2022. Yep. So, so first of all, what, what happened with the PAC Act, the PACT Act is, is outrageous. Our commitment to our veterans is ironclad. And thanking a veteran means a lot more than just saying thank you. It means delivering services to take care of our veterans for life when they get home. And we're going to get that bill passed because we have to get that bill passed because that compact means something between a veteran and their country. So we're going to get that passed. And of course, semiconductors, we need to get passed. But it's not directly analogous here, because remember, those bills can pass in the House. The Senate is a broken institution. This idea of the filibuster, this idea that one senator can simply hold up the entirety of a progress and that you'd have to get to a supermajority in order to move things forward is undemocratic. Uh, and, 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 and so that's why it's being held up, because without the filibuster, this is law. And, and so that, that, that is a, a Senate procedural debate. I'm not running for Senate. I don't plan on running for Senate. I'm running for the House of Representatives, but I absolutely am an American. And I believe that the filibuster is, is, is anti-democratic and it's holding up progress in this country. Um, we won't go into what happens if uh, you have Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House and not Nancy Pelosi. Um, but why do it, there, there's a question and this seems to be, you, you actually brought it up mm -hmm. and I'll ask that. And that is, um, messaging. Republicans seem to do a better job at messaging than Democrats. Um, is it because you have Dem the Democratic Party is a broader coalition, um, or is it something else? How do you, how do how would you, as a congressman um, representing those positions, um, get get your point across? and persuade people. Sure, so I, I think, you know, politicians, you know, all across the country, but uh, in my opinion, in the Democratic Party, don't do a good enough job of tailoring messaging to the individual districts they represent and the individual constituents that they serve. And I've served for 10 years in local government. I ran five tough races, I won all five. Uh, and quite frankly, in every single election, I've tailored my messaging specifically to what I'm going to do at the local level for my constituents running for legislature to Democrat in a Trump district. I spoke about getting every county road in my district paved. I spoke about specific parks that needed to be upgraded, specific schools that got public safety measures. I delivered millions of dollars in grants for those public schools, uh, educating my constituents on what I've done to improve their lives, what I've done to make their lives better. Right. We know that people we represent won't agree with us 100% of the time, most likely may, maybe not even a majority of the time, but we need people we represent to, to understand what we're doing to make their lives better and to believe that we have their best interest at heart, even if they have individual policy disagreements with us. And so as a member of Congress, I'm never gonna lose that local touch. I, I hold town halls in every part of my district. I had a telephone town hall last night with 2,100 people. I'm never gonna lose a pulse of the community. I've lived here my entire life. I'll continue to hold town halls all across this district. I'll continue to have an open door policy. I'll continue to deliver on the local level because I, I like to joke, you know, roads and sewers and, and, and local infrastructure isn't super sexy to some, but it matters, right? When you hit that pothole driving out of your driveway, that matters to you, right? When you have like residents on the North Shore aging cesspools and you need to upgrade to these newer septic tanks to make sure that we're reducing nitrogen in our, in our, in our waterways, you know, that, that keeps your family healthier and it keeps the environment healthier. So I'm a hyper-local 
the politician here. And obviously, I'm not afraid to take a position on national issues, but I'll always localize my messaging to the people that I serve. Um, just one final question, penultimate question yeah. before your final question. Sure. Um, and this ties in with energy policy, but climate change. Yep. Um, it's here. It is. Um, what do we do now? Everyone was saying, oh, this is the future. It'll be too expensive. Um, if you look in Kentucky, and I think the death count is now up to 36 for floods that they've never had. Um, and you see the fires out west. You see, you, you, you see around the world, you see people dying in heat waves. Yep. Um, what ought to be done right now that's not being done in terms of climate change? Because this seems like an existential crisis that is kind of, we're kind of, uh, that's kind of not being addressed uh, as seriously as, as it should. It, it is. Climate change is the existential threat of our times. Every year I've run as legislator, I've been endorsed by the League of Conservation Voters and by the Sierra Club because I have said time and time again, and I'll continue to say it, that climate change needs to have the utmost urgency from our government. This is a matter of life and death. This is not just a matter of debate. It's here and the science is clear. 2022 is one of the warmest years on record. We have no time to waste. And so as a local legislator and what I've done, I've made Nassau County uh, for the first time in our history, we've become a climate smart community. We've bolstered renew renewable energy capabilities. We've had record investments in wastewater treatment and conservation, and we've held polluters accountable. Uh, but at the federal level, we need immediate urgent actions to curb carbon emissions, right? We need concrete projects that will get shovels in the ground now to tackle climate change. We need to clean our air, we need to reduce carbon emissions, and we need to restore our wildlife and ecology. Uh, so we need immediate federal investments in renewable energy to finally eliminate our dependence on foreign oil, to bring down energy costs, to modernize our grid. We need more public charging stations available and expanding the electric vehicle tax credit to shift away from the eternal combustion engine and help people get electric vehicles. We need to protect access to drinking water, right? If we were gonna talk about climate change, we have to talk about clean drinking water. So we need to make sure that we're delivering federal aid to our local water districts so they can remove chemicals like 1,4-dioxane and other harmful chemicals and allow them to set up new treatment systems where here in the Jericho Water District, there was a well that was contaminated with Freon. Uh, you know, there needs to be a treatment tower. Uh, we need water districts across the island and, and, and in Queens to have that same kind of infrastructure. Uh, we know rising sea levels and warmer temperatures, it means more dangerous and frequent storms. So we need investment in coastal resiliency and we need more investment in, in, in flooding and drainage. Modernizing mass transit is part of the conversation on climate change. The more people who take public transit, the more we reduce carbon emissions. So we need to electrify the Oyster Bay branch of the Long Island Railroad. We need to fight fare hikes and we need to make Penn Station safer. Uh, we need to protect the Long Island Sound by holding polluters accountable on strengthening penalties for uh, you know, you know, those who operate illegally. Uh, and quite frankly, we need inter international cooperation. We need to work with the White House to ensure global cooperation because climate change is not just an American issue. It is a global and a human issue and an existential threat to all of us here. So. That's an ambitious agenda, but we have no choice but to push for an ambitious agenda because I'd like my children and grandchildren to live in a world where we can breathe clean air and drink clean water. And at the pace we are going, climate change poses a, a danger to the entire human species that is not hyperbole, it's science and it's fact. Okay. Um, so given the stakes that are, that are involved in this, uh, in, in this election, um, why, why are, why would you be the best choice? You're, you're running against John Kamen, Robert Zimmerman, Melanie DeRigo, um, Rima Rasul. What makes you the best candidate among them? Sure, Steve, you know, we have to keep this seat in the Democratic column. And I'm the only Democrat running that can keep this seat in Democratic hands. I'll remind you that I'm the only sitting elected official running. I'm the only Democrat who's won in a Trump district, and I won that district three times. I've raised more money than the other candidates, and 538's projected that not only am I going to win the primary, but I'm the candidate that can win the general. We need a Democrat who can pull coalitions together and win in November. We have to keep this seat in the Democratic column. If we do not, we cannot keep the House. And so I'm the Democrat that can do that, and I'm the best candidate uh, running in the Democratic primary uh, to keep this seat in the Democratic column. Okay. 
I'd like to thank Josh Lapisan for this important discussion, as well as all those who attended. I'd like to also thank uh, Northwell Health for sponsoring uh, this morning's event. Normally we have it in the evening. Uh, for those who were unable to watch today, a recording of our discussion uh, can be found on Blank Slate Media's website, theisland360.com, on our face, and you can get there by our Facebook page and you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, a story about this morning's event will also appear in this week's six Blank Slate newspapers um, that will be out on Friday and it'll be on our website. Um, the Island Now 360.com even before that. So again, I would like to thank uh, Josh Lassuzan for taking his time at a busy time in the campaign and um, sharing his views uh, with us.